Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in the Harvard Classics Lectures. We are now in lecture 115. We are in Walden, Thoreau's Walden, chapter 16, The Pond in Winter. Here we will see Thoreau as scientist, researcher, geologist, of course surveyor. He was trained as a surveyor. So we're going to find here now that he's going to be paying attention to some of the specifics of the pond. Now in some ways, this is a return back to earlier parts of Walden when we were talking about the multiple ponds of Walden. If there are multiple uh, ponds, there's multiple Thoreau's, and if there's multiple Thoreau's, then there's multiple readers of this poem, Walden. We call it a poem because it's such a beautifully constructed prose poem in my estimation. Now, our assumptions here that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net uh, in the, in the uh, Harvard Classics folder, especially lectures 99 to 114, as well that you're conversant with our three levels of reading at level one of annotative work. What does the text say at level two? What does the text mean to A, themes, messages to B? Not what Thoreau says, but how Thoreau says it, especially in this uh, reading of this chapter, the symbolism that will be at play, especially of the ponds, uh, um, identity, especially in winter. And then finally at level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? At 3A, how can I relate to other parts of Walden as well as other texts I know? And then finally, um, how can I relate to this uh, stuff personally? Um, and then finally, our assumptions are that you're conversant with our big five, as we call it in 303. That is to say, what does this text say about epistemology, what one can know? Here we're going to have quite a bit of fun. Um, uh, what does this text say about ontology and who we are? We've already talked about the multiple ponds and therefore the multiple thoreaus and therefore the multiple reader, uh, readers themselves. And then uh, what does this text say about psychology and sociology, the study of the individual mind of the group? And then finally, what does this text say about theodicy and the existence of evil suffering in the world? Now, we come really with uh, chapter 16 to the end of Walden, 16, 17, 18. We begin to wind down the project that has been the Odyssey, can we call it that? The voyage, the Odyssey, the experiments uh, uh, that Thoreau will be playing with that quest to awaken, as he says, not by mechanical aids in chapter 2, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn. We're going to be playing some similar games here. Um, we begin to move from, of course, winter to spring. We'll move... Uh, by the end of this chapter into spring, and then of course the next chapter, uh, 17, is called spring itself. Now at the beginning of, uh, of the pond in winter, chapter 16, um, where uh, Thoreau tells us that he awakens, which takes us back again to this notion of waking up, both literally and, and uh, metaphysically. Uh, Thoreau awakens with this interesting impression, a vague one he calls, that He's been asked a question that he's been trying to maybe answer, but uh, up to this point, unsuccessfully answer. And of course, this is at the heart, I think, of Walden. We have questions all the way through. The big five, we could call the big questions, the big five questions. In other words, what can you really know? Who really are you? How does your individual mind work? How do the groups of uh, people work when they get together? And then finally, why is there so much pain in the world, and as we said, Thoreau loves to argue that we have to learn to ask not why did this happen to me when bad stuff happens, but why did this happen for me. He looks out upon uh, the, the world of nature as, quote, an answered question, end quote, and this will begin to, uh, dis uh, and we see Thoreau at his transcendental best, we could argue, at the end of the poem, Walden. Um, and then, of course, he looks into the daylight, and all of a sudden he will tell us that his anxiety is removed. Um, the darkness the dormancy, we might say, of winter um, will in some ways sometimes slow down the spiritual processes, but the dawn, he will argue, of each day provides us with a new beginning. We'll see this in some of our reading in a moment. And then he goes in search of water. He'll take his axe to the pond's frozen surface, up to 16 inches, we're told, that the pond's surface can freeze, and he looks into the window that he will cut in the ice, and then below, of course, he sees all kinds of life uh, despite the absence from, uh, from above. And of course, uh, we said the same thing about Ruthie's tree. I mean, when it's in the spring, summer, it looks, it looks totally alive. In the fall, winter, it can look completely dead, and yet we know that nature is there, present even then. That is to say, and he will make this metaphysical argument, that the workings of God in nature are present even when we don't expect them or we don't see them, right? Uh, to see into the life of things, a 3A observation is the way Wordsworth talks about it in Tentern Abbey, a, a text we've commented on uh, at length elsewhere at learnstrong.net. And then he tells us about the fishermen who will come to the pond. And again, these are not profound, complex men. These are simple men, he calls them. But in some ways, they're wiser than they know. 
They're wild, they're very natural, they pay little attention to the way you're supposed to do it in society, the dictates and whims, as, uh, as Thoreau will talk about it. He will describe surveying, which is something he knows a thing or two about from his own, from his own professional work. Um, the surveying at the bottom of Walden in 1846, he's able to assure all of us as readers that Walden is in fact not bottomless, although there was always these rumors that it was, but it is 102 feet deep, he will tell us. Um, and then he says there is, and making a very interesting ontological observation, there's always a need for mystery, he says. And as long as he says we're believers in the infinite, ponds will seem bottomless. It's a compelling idea. And then, of course, in probing, as, as, we're, as, as we're doing this very thing with him, the depths of bodies of water, he says, imagination dives down deeper into the realities of nature. He then will express the transcendental idea that if we knew, he says, and this is of course an outright epistemological observation, if we knew all the laws of nature, one natural fact or phenomenon would be enough to allow us to infer all of the information um, to the whole. But our, uh, he says our knowledge of nature's laws is obviously imperfect. From this he then will begin to talk about the pond, and the ways that ponds remind him a lot of humankind in general. Obviously, the scientific calculation of a man's height, or his depth, or his character uh, from the exterior, and his circumstances will only tell us so much about that man or that individual. The pond, obviously, and the individual are both, we might say, microcosms of something quite more important. He then talks about the commercial ice cutting at Walden Pond, and this is a, this is a fun uh, bit of reading. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to, to read it all, but it's quite good. Um, and he says, despite at first what might seem a violation of the poem's integrity, Walden remains unharmed, unchanged. In other words, humans can only do so much um, to try and jack with, with Walden Pond. Moreover, he says, ice from the pond is shipped far and wide, even as far away as India, where others thus drink from, as he calls it, his spiritual well. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful word picture, right? That the, the, the pond freezes over in the winter. Cutters come in and cut this stuff. And his, and his, um, his discussion of this is like they're farmers in dirt, only now they're working in, in the ice. And that ice is sent all over, the, all over the place, all over the world. Finally, being uh, Thoreau, the uh, lover of the Upanishadic tradition, lover of the Bhagavad Gita, the text that he took with him, um, he says Walden water will mix with Ganges water. Of course, Ganges, the great, the spiritual, the holy river of India. Um, as Thoreau bathes his intellect, quote, in the stupendous and cosmogonical philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and and uh, obviously this is an exchange um, in Thoreau's mind, not a literal exchange, but a metaphysical exchange. Now when we turn to the pond in winter, and, uh, and this chapter, there's so much of this that I would love to read that I just can't, but let's enjoy a few of them. The, again, once you read uh, Walden, especially aloud, I find that you can't help but call it a prose poem. After a still winter night, I woke with the impression that some question had been put to me, which I had been endeavoring in vain to answer in my sleep as what, how, when, where, but there was dawning nature in whom all creatures live, looking in my broad windows with serene and satisfied face, and no question on her lips. I woke to an answered question, to nature and daylight, the snow lying deep on the earth dotted with young pines, and the very slope of the hill on which my house is placed seemed to say, forward. Now, this notion of fair forward will make us think about T.S. Eliot's um, uh, uh, Dry Cell of Ages. You can find all my lectures on, on um, Four Quartets. I said this before. I think T.S. Eliot was heavily influenced by Thoreau and Walden, and I think in ways that he himself never fully um, accepted. But if you look at Four Quartets closely and you look at Walden, it is amazing how much is there. Uh, fair forward uh, is the direct quote from Dry Cell of Ages, and here it is. It's as if Nature itself and the sloping of the of the hill uh, of the house um, is like telling him go forward, forward. Nature puts no question and answers none which we mortals ask. She has long ago taken her resolution. O prince, and now we have in quotation marks. O prince, our eyes contemplate with admiration and transmit to the soul the wonderful and varied spectacle of this universe 
uh, the, the lines, we begin with the Bhagavad Gita and we finish this chapter with the Bhagavad Gita. The night veils without doubt a part of this glorious creation, but day comes to reveal to us this great work which extends from earth even to the plains of the ether, end quote. Then, he says, then to my morning work. First, I take an axe and pail and go in search of water, if that be not a dream. After a cold and snowy night, it needed a divining rod to find it. So how one wakes in the morning. I mean, I think this is one of the important observations of Thoreau. Your day is in large measure dependent upon the first few seconds when you open your eyes. If you open your eyes and you say, let's go forward, let's do something, your day is going to have a certain kind of color, pattern, rhythm to it. Harmony, we might even say. If you wake and the first thought is, oh, another wretched day, I wish I could just sleep forever, it's going to affect your day. This is the argument that he makes. And here you can experiment on yourself. I mean, try it for a week. Every morning, try it for seven straight days to awaken and say, regardless of what day it is, there are no weekends or real days in time. That is to say, in real time, right? Wake up every morning and ask the simple question, how do I go forward today? Now let's do it with a certain attitude of expectation that's, of course, very Thoreauian, and watch how it affects your day. Give it a week and try it. Thoreau will argue it's a way to awaken. He says a few lines later, Standing on the snow-covered plain, as if in a pasture amid the hills, I cut my way first through a foot of snow and then a foot of ice, and open a window under my feet, where kneeling to drink, I look down into the quiet parlor of the fishes, pervaded by a softened light as though a window of ground glass with its bright sanded floor, the same as in summer. There a perennial waveless serenity reigns, as in the amber twilight sky, corresponding to the cool and even temperate of the inhabitants. Heaven is under our feet, as well as over our heads. I find this to be a wonderful line, and of course he's talking about the world that's under the ice. And then he talks about the fish, and more particularly, the uh, pickerel, <clears throat> the fish, he talk, uh, how beautiful they are. He says, ah, oh, the pickerel Walden. When I see them lying on the ice or in the well, which the fisherman cuts in the ice, making a little hole to admit the water, I'm always surprised by their rare beauty, as if they were fabulous fishes that are so foreign to the streets, even to the woods, foreign as Arabia to our Concord life. A few, a few lines later, he begins to talk about surveying and the work in 46. He says, it's remarkable how long men will believe in the bottomlessness of a pond without taking the trouble to sound it. I visited two such bottomless ponds in one walk in this neighborhood. Many have believed that Walden reached quite through to the other side of the globe. And he'll talk about people that have laid on the ice and looked down into the clear water and believed they could see a long ways. He says a few lines later to tell us it's 102 feet deep. The greatest depth, he says, was exactly 102 feet. And by the way, uh, Walden has been surveyed a number of times, and it has been um, uh, 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 any number of people who have done this have been amazed. The Rome was pretty much dead on with his map making and cartography of the uh, of the uh, uh, pond and the uh, and the surrounding areas and the depth at which he was measuring as well. He says the greatest depth was exactly 102 feet, to which maybe he added the five feet which it has risen since making 107 feet, right? This is a remarkable depth for so small an area, yet not an inch of it can be spared by the imagination. What if all ponds were shallow? Would it not react on the minds of men? I'm thankful that this pond was made deep and pure for a symbol. And I mean, there it is, right? I mean, we're working, obviously, at level 2B when he becomes even self-conscious of working rhetorically at level 2B. The pond is a symbol. And the deeper the pond goes, the deeper the challenges of, obviously, reading a beautiful poem like this, right? While men believe in the infinite, some ponds will be thought to be bottomless. It's a wonderful line. And, of course, that capacity to continue to believe in something beyond beyond the obvious, right, that, that transcends the obvious, is compelling. A few lines later, he says it this way when he's talking about the beautiful laws of nature. If we all, uh, I'm sorry, if we knew all the laws of nature, we should need only one fact or the description of one actual phenomenon to infer all the particular results at that point. Now, we know only a few laws, and our result is vivitated, not, of course, by any confusion or irregularity in nature, but by our ignorance of essential elements 
in the calculation. Remember, he said, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to find only the essential facts. Here is the, uh, again, essential elements, right? All about the essential. That, that's such a Platonist idea, such a Socratic idea. Remember what Socrates says in Apology, uh, in Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. Our notions of law and harmony are commonly confined to those instances which we detect. But the harmony which results from a far greater number of seemingly conflicting but really concurring laws which we have not detected is still more wonderful. This is his theodistic position. This is his answer to the theodicy question. It may seem that life is really out of sorts and life is always complicated to the degree that one can never understand it. And yet, that's only the appearance. There is a harmony, there is a pattern, there's a beauty behind all of it. He says the particular laws are as our points of view. Notice it's plural. Points of view. As to the traveler, a mountain outline varies with every step, and it has an infinite number of profiles, although absolutely but one form. Even when cleft or bored through, it is not comprehended in its entirety. And I think that's huge, I mean, for us to appreciate it, for, as we're ending now our study of Walden, and I grow a bit sad at lugubrious thinking about the ending of our study together, and yet think about all of the ways in which the point he's just made has been made again and again and again. Everything has multiple perspectives, and it's those multiple perspectives that challenge us epistemologically to the fallibilist position. Find a person who is absolutely certain of his or her political views. Challenge them to see the complete opposite of those views. You'll remember what F. Scott Fitzgerald said, to be able to hold two alternate views in one's mind simultaneously is the mark of intelligence or genius. And of course Thoreau is suggesting all you've got to do is look at Ruthie's tree to know that. He continues, when I, what I have observed of the pond is no less true in ethics. It's the law of average. Such a rule of the two Demeters not only guides us towards the sun and the system and the heart of the man, but draws lines through the length and breadth of the aggregate of a man's particular daily behaviors and ways of life into its codes and inlets, and where they intersect will be the height or depth of his character. Perhaps we need only to know how he shores trend in his adjunct country or circumstances to infer his depth and concealed bottom. If he is surrounded by mountainous circumstances, an Achillean shore, and we're back again to the Iliad and Achilles, whose peaks overshadow and are reflected in his bosom, they suggest a corresponding depth in him. And then a few lines later, at the advent of each individual into this life, may we not suppose that such a bar has risen to the surface somewhere? It is true, we are such poor navigators that our thoughts, for the most part, stand off and on upon a harborless coast, are conversant only with the bites of the bays of posy or steer from the public ports of entry and go into the dry docks of science where they merely refit for this world and no natural currents concur to individualize them. I mean, again, those of us who are poets, we would say if we could just write one set of lines that even come remotely close to the lines we just read, they are truly, truly compelling, right? He will um, continue by commenting uh, at the very conclusion of this chapter about ice. And, and, and again, everything is a metaphor for, um, for Thoreau. And obviously we think about frosts. Um, some say the world will end with ice and some with fire. And, 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 and we're going to play a similar game here. He says ice is an interesting subject for contemplation. I mean, let's be fair. Everything is an interesting subject for contemplation for a person who's able to see. They told me that they had some in the ice houses at Fresh Pond five years old, which was as good as ever. This is to say the, the ice of Walden Pond. Why is it that a bucket of water soon becomes putrid, but frozen remains sweet forever? It's commonly said that this is the difference between the affections and the intellect. We're back to obviously Plato's Republic and the idea of the distinctions between the affections and the intellect, reason versus emotion desires. Thus, he says, for 16 days I saw from my window a hundred men at work. He's talking about these guys who were cutting up the ice. Work like busy husbandmen with teams and horses and apparently all the implements of farming. Such a picture as we see on the first page of the Almanac. And as often as I looked out, I was reminded of the fable of the lark and the reapers or the parable of the sower and the light. And now they're all gone. And in 30 days more probably I shall look from the same window on the pure sea green Walden water there, reflecting the clouds and the trees and sending up its evaporations into solitude. And no traces will appear that a man was ever, had, had ever stood there. Perhaps... I shall hear a solitary loon laugh as he dives and plumes himself, or shall see a lonely fisher in the boat, 
Now, like a floating leaf, the holding is more reflected in the waves where lately a hundred men secured labor. Uh, now, and he, he's saying, out on the ice. In other words, they're all working to cut up this ice. And he says, here in a few days, it'll be, well, we'll be in the spring and all the ice will be gone. Thus, he says, it appears that the sweltering inhabitants of Charleston and New Orleans, of Madras and Bombay and Calcutta, drink at my well. In the morning, I bake my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogenical philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, since whose composition years of the gods have elapsed, and in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seem puny and trivial. And I doubt if that philosophy is not to be referred to a previous state of existence, so remote it's it, it, so remote is its sublimity from our conceptions. I lay down the book and go to my well for water, and lo, there I meet the servant of the Brahmin, priest of Brahma and Vishnu and Indra, who still sits in his temple on the Ganges reading the Vedas, or dwells at the root of a tree with his crest and water jug. I meet his servant come to draw water from his master, and our buckets, as it were, great together in the same well. The tr pure woolen water is mingled with the sacred water of the Ganges. With favoring winds, it is wafted past the site of the fabulous islands of Atlantis and the Hesperides, makes the Periplus of Hano, and floating by Ternate and Tidor, and the mouth of the Persian Gulf, melts in the tropic gales of the Indian seas, and is landed in ports of which Alexander only heard the names. Notice the genius of Thoreau. He will finish with Alexander, the great, the great conqueror, who of course carried with him often the Iliad because he wanted to be the Achilles of all Achilles. And yet notice he finishes with the Bhagavad Gita, a text that is a song of war, a dialogue on a battlefield. Fascinating. The genius of Thoreau is that he's able to join together such disparate, seemingly disparate strands of thought. That is to say, what he learned from his time spent in the woods, spending so much time with the trees. Well, speaking of the woods and the trees, speaking of ice turning into water in the spring, we will turn next to the end of Walden. If we've said all these are pairs, we'll come back to these pairs now with spring and conclusion, and we'll be ready to end our study of Walden, or we might say, begin our study of Walden.